Hi, I'm Kira Becker, and I'm here with Philip Bath, the primary investigator of the TARDIS study. Philip, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about TARDIS. Yes, it's a, a trial, a large trial, 3,092 patients, looking at how to prevent recurrence after acute ischemic stroke or transient ischemic attack. And it was done in the UK, in New Zealand, in Georgia, uh, and Denmark. And I had the pleasure of presenting the results today, the main results. So we recruited people within uh, 48 hours. It was a very wide inclusion criteria, which was deliberate. Uh, we included both ischemic stroke and TIAs, but within the ischemic stroke, we included people with isolated dysphasia or isolated hemianopia, providing there was some imaging evidence of a new event. Uh, we included in the TIA group people who had uh, crescendo TIA, so multiple TIAs within a week, and those who'd had a recurrent event on uh, two antiplatelets. So we really wanted to try and include lots of people who wouldn't necessarily get in a, in a trial like this. So uh, following recruitment, within the 48 hours, uh, they were randomized to uh, either triple or intensive antiplatelet therapy, and that comprised standard drugs, aspirin, clopidogrel, and dipridamol. Uh, or in the control group, um, initially aspirin and dipridamol, but the guidelines in the UK changed, so we uh, included um, a clopidogrel only control group, so people could be uh, randomized to either intensive or one or two drugs, depending on what uh, the investigator at the hospital thought. And they took the drugs for 30 days, and then they went on to standard of care, which was usually clopidogrel, um, until day 90, and then we ascertained whether they'd had a recurrent stroke uh, or a TIA, uh, and how severe that was. So we used the modified ranking scale, and the, one of the novel things about TARDIS was really probably the first time in a, uh, a prevention trial was to not just count events, but to look at how serious they are. So if you've had a, a recurrent stroke, it could be fatal, it could be severe, uh, making you dependent, it might be moderate, it might be mild, you might have another TIA. Now the advantage of that was that it allowed us to cut the sample size down from about 8,000 to 4,000. So this is an appealing technique and it may be one way that we can try and reduce sample size for trials because it's got so big now. So we aimed for 4,100 patients. Um, we actually got stopped at 3,000, uh, or the mid, uh, 3,050 uh, 3, or something like that. The data monitoring committee rang me up and said, you need to look at your data as a safety issue. So the trial steering committee looked at those data and um, some extra data and decided to call a halt to recruitment uh, in April 2016 and that uh, meant by then that 3,096 patients have been recruited uh, and obviously we've analysed the data and uh, we have the results today. Can you tell us about those results? So the primary outcome was as I said stroke and its severity uh, as well as TIA and there was no difference between the two groups. The trial was neutral. Now when I say stroke, it includes both ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke, so we were looking at the balance of good and bad in terms of stroke prevention. So that was neutral. Um, there was a, an interesting subgroup interaction, um, and oh, actually two subgroups. One was the severity of stroke at baseline, so it looked like triple therapy might have been better than guideline therapy in people who had a mild stroke when they came in. And that's an NI at stroke scale of three or less. Whereas triple therapy might have been worse if they had a more severe stroke. The other interaction was the type of comparator. Um, and broadly speaking, it looked like if you added aspirin and dipridamol to clopidogrel, you made things worse. Uh, but if you added um, clopidogrel to aspirin and dipridamol, uh, it went the other way. It went in favor of triple therapy. So slightly challenging results to, to understand. 
course, the other outcome of, of major interest is, is bleeding. And we looked at this, we used the same concept of how severe is bleeding, not just counting major bleeds, but looking at severity. So minor bleeds, moderate bleeds, severe bleeds, fatal bleeds. Here, the trial was absolutely significant. Triple therapy was associated with far worse bleeding. Um, again, there was an interaction. Uh, this time, just one, and that was with the type of comparator, again. Um, now, bearing in mind that bleeding was worse in across the whole trial, uh, we found or observed that um, adding clopidogrel to aspirin and dipridamol really was associated with, with worse bleeding. And uh, if you added the other way around, you added clopidogrel to aspirin and dipridamol, although there was increased bleeding, it wasn't so bad. Um, now, it's important in trials where there is a potential benefit and a hazard is to look at the net benefit. Um, as I've already said, the net benefit for stroke was, was null. There was no difference bet between stroke overall, including ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. But you can look at deaths, you can look at serious adverse events, and you can look at composites of things like stroke plus major bleeding, or the sort of composite that cardiologists would use of death and stroke and myocardial infarction and major and fatal bleeding. And those were all neutral. So overall, this trial was neutral. No one came to harm, but they didn't benefit either. So you mentioned there was a, um, an important difference in subgroups depending on what the comparator was, both for safety and for potential efficacy. Does that tell you anything about the relative um, efficacy or safety of the individual antiplatelet agents used? To be honest, I haven't got my head completely around these <laughs> subgroup interactions. Um, I, I think what it tells us is if you're on clopidogrel, adding aspirin and dipridamol, um, in terms of, of, of efficacy, it, it, it doesn't really make a difference. It, it's it's uh, not, not helpful. Whereas adding clopidogrel to aspirin and dipridamol, it's a potent antiplatelet. It probably is beneficial. In terms of bleeding, obviously they're both, uh, uh, however you cut the data, triple is, is, is bad. Um, but I guess if you've got, if you're doing a comparison that involves aspirin and clopidogrel with just clopidogrel, it's going to be worse and, and uh, conversely, and the, and the same the other way around. So there's no doubt that clopidogrel it, it influenced bleeding when it was a added to aspirin and dipridamol. Um, now, of course, these data reflect UK guidelines where we use clopidogrel primarily but also a little bit of aspirin and dipridamol, sometimes a aspirin alone. We didn't test aspirin alone in this trial and of course that is um, a, a standard of care here in the US. So I can't speak about aspirin alone. And I wonder if you could also comment on uh, another antiplatelet agent which wasn't evaluated in your study um, but was talked about in the presentation immediately after yours which is celostazole. What do you think the relative benefits or, or, or issues might be about looking at addition of celostazole to other antiplatelet agents? Well, there's no good um, data from the West, either Europe or the US. Uh, so all the celostazole data come from um, the Far East. My personal view is it's an a underexplored drug in, in, in the West, and I can tell you that we're doing two trials of it at the moment. <laughs> It's a drug that is similar in many respects to dipridamol. Um, they work in analogous ways, one by blocking uh, phosphodiesterase 3 and the other one by blocking phosphodiesterase 5. But, but the result is that they're uh, mildly antiplatelet. Um, they have vasodilatory effects. They affect smooth muscle cells and so on. I, I think both those drugs have multiple effects. Um, that are not just conventional platelet effects that we would expect with aspirin and um, clopidogrel. So, uh, well, my personal belief is we need to test them because the data from the Far East are very interesting. Um, it looks like celostazole, particularly when added to aspirin, is um, better. Uh, that celostazole, when compared with aspirin, there may be less bleeding. And the talk today was interesting because it was a population of people who had had hemorrhages. 
and it looked like psilocytazole might be better than aspirin in that context. So these were people who had ischemic strokes, but who also had hemorrhage in the past or had microbleeds. So uh, very interesting data, and I think we have something to learn. And one final question about TARDIS. Um, you had a 48-hour period for enrollment. Do you think the data would have been different if you had a shorter time window for enrollment? Yes, that's an important question, um, particularly if you consider that the chance trial of aspirin and clopidogrel versus aspirin had a 24-hour time window, and the ongoing point trial of aspirin and clopidogrel uh, has a 12-hour time window. We deliberately chose um, 48 hours um, because we were we knew that we were going to struggle to recruit if we had a much shorter time window. Now the simple answer to your question is if you look at the um, event curves for major bleeding they separate over the um, uh, over the 30 days of treatment. So um, one of the concerns we had was if we should have given not 30 days but 14 days mm. but in fact if you if you look at the um, event curves over those first first 14 days it doesn't make a difference so the length of treatment wasn't wasn't relevant so then there's the other question is should we have limited recruitment uh, to people who were earlier apart from damaging recruitment um, we've looked at TARDIS we know that people who are recruited within the first 12 hours versus 12 to 24 hours versus 24 to 48 hours the event rate falls you're much more likely to have a recurrent event if you're recruited within 12 hours than 12 to 24 than 24 to uh, 48 so there's no doubt that you um, have more events in people who recruited earlier whether there is a difference um, in outcomes is questionable because when we looked at time of recruitment in the subgroups it didn't show anything. So I can't answer your question um, fully but I suspect it wouldn't have made a difference. Well thank you Dr. Bath and congratulations on a trial very well done and the use of a very novel endpoint for a stroke prevention trial. Thank you very much Cara.